Hello. Welcome to Archival Adventures. Happy Wednesday afternoon. Uh, today is the third day of classes for the fall 2022 semester here at Virginia Tech. And uh, this is the weekly program where I share things with you from archives and special collections here at uh, Virginia Tech. As I mentioned before, I don't know, that was weird. It wasn't scripted. I was just, anyway. Hi, I'm uh, Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And um, as I said, we're going to be looking at some things from the archives, um, specifically special collections and university archives. And today, we're going to be looking at, um, I forget, what did I say it was? Everyday letters from notable people. That was a compromised language. I had said insignificant letters. I had said famous people. I don't know. They're sort of mundane, everyday type communications in the most part. That's what we're seeking out. We may find some of, you know, their more like career related letters along the way. We'll find out. Who knows? Um, and notable people because famous implies a level of notoriety uh, that given that these are historical figures and you may never have heard of them, um, I'm not sure applied, but yet they would qualify uh, and likely would have been famous if it were, if they were like alive and active today. So anyway, qualifiers, qualifiers. Uh, I should say hello to everybody who's here. Um, I hope that you are um, having a good day. I do want to drop <laughs> the... I will, I will drop commands in a moment. Um, hi, Lord Portico. Hi, Key Squared. It's good to see you in chat. Um, hello, anybody who's here and is not in chat. I appreciate the lurkers. Um, today, we're going to try something slightly different with the um, recitation of the land and labor acknowledgement from the university. And that is, I'm going to throw those words up on screen while I read them. Uh, so... <laughs> um, let me drop that link in the chat here, and we're going to actually do this, uh, which this is the land and labor land acknowledgement and labor recognition official from the university. Uh, I do like to begin the stream with this because I think it's important to keep in mind um, as we are doing things uh, and for people outside the university to pay attention to what we're saying and make sure that we're actually making progress towards achieving it. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to UTPROSIM, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So I do think it is very important to keep that in mind as we move forward with the things that we do here. Um, that said, I also have this ready to show you, and I just realized I can't see chat for one of the channels while I'm doing this this way, um, so I'm just going to take a second and pull that up. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Show me the chat. So if you've been saying things in chat, I haven't seen them. I can, I can make a quick check because this won't show me uh, past conversations. I can just boot back here for a second and then we can look at the um, finding aid info. There, hi Shadows of Life. <laughs> it's good to see you. 
yeah, we're, we've got things. There are things. Um, anywho, now I have a chat like on another screen in front of me. So I can both share and see chat. Um, but let me go ahead and drop the um, finding aid command over here. Uh, Portico, I saw you already got it over there. Um, so yeah, as I said today, we don't have a single collection we're looking at. We are looking at a variety of items. Um, and you have access to actually uh, view this document uh, via the links that are in the uh, chat right now. Um, what I've pulled today is personal correspondence from these collections. So the collections are linked, but it is specifically just personal correspondence that I have pulled. Um, there's no way we will get to everything. So if you see something on here that you want me to make sure to get to, do let me know in chat so that I can make sure to get to that. Because um, there's more here than we will ever touch in two hours. Uh, but we have a letter from uh, Henry David Thoreau. Um, we have a, let's see, letters that are in the, the Dayton Kohler papers. Uh, Dayton Kohler himself was a professor of English, but there's correspondence in here, including with uh, Sherwood Anderson, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Catherine Ann Porter, who were all authors. We have a significant amount of Sherwood Anderson material that at some point I'm going to have to share on stream. Um, I'm uncertain exactly how famous Sherwood Anderson is because I am completely unfamiliar with Sherwood Anderson, but boy, do we have a lot of his stuff. And there are a lot of people that know who he is. So I'm going to have to learn, and, and I'll probably learn about that with you all on stream sometime in the future. Um, I have a folder or a collection, the Henry James Letters, which is what inspired this entire stream. Um, because there are four letters uh, that are completely, as far as I can tell, unrelated to his being an author. Um, we have uh, some letters from the Buckminster Fuller collection. If you're not familiar, Buckminster Fuller is the architect who patented the geodesic dome. Uh, we have um, at least one letter from Lillian Gish who was a, a silent film actress. Um, within the G. Burke Johnston papers, we have photocopies of correspondence with J.R.R. Tolkien and Priscilla Tolkien. Um, it is correspondence with Johnston, but they are not original documents. We just have photocopies. But we can still read the letters and, and see what they're about. I also am uncertain whether they are related to um, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, work as an author or not. Corresponding with an English professor, there's a good likelihood that it is, but I threw them on here anyway. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, Priscilla Tolkien is J.R.R. Tolkien's daughter. Um, oh, you visited the Catherine Ann Porter archive when you were in school. Awesome. I'm I, another author that I'm not familiar with. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, Christopher Kraft. Uh, I have... There's a lot of personal correspondence in the Christopher Kraft papers. I pulled four folders. I pulled the folders for 1959, 1961, 1963, and 1964. Um, because there's a heck of a lot in there, and as I said, we're never going to get to everything. Uh, so those were the first four years in it, and those are the ones I pulled. Uh, Kraft was a NASA engineer. Uh, he ran mission control for the Apollo 11 uh, moon landing, and the current mission control center at the Johnson Space Center in Houston is named after him. Uh, the Michael Collins papers, uh, he was 
various things. You can see pilot, astronaut, uh, assistant secretary of state, National Air and Space Museum director, and an author. He was um, the mission control pilot. So he was the pilot of the Apollo 11 mission. He stayed on the lunar orbiter while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin descended to the lunar surface. And he was the first documented human to have been completely isolated from all communication with the planet Earth for a period of time. When he was on the uh, far side of the moon, he was cut off from all communication with any other humans. Um, and it's a, quite a unique perspective. Uh, we have his papers here, and among them, Series 9 includes personal correspondence. So I have that here today. Uh, the W. Dale Parker papers, we've looked at his brother's materials on screen. The, if you were here, we looked at a collection of material from, um, oh, I'm not going to remember his name, but um, it was a collection of material about uh, designing a jetpack uh, for NASA. Um, this is that guy's brother, and he was a ma the manager for a manager for NASA's Project Gemini, an author, an entrepreneur, and a politician. And boy, is he um, very self-confident. Let's say. Anyway, there's pen pal correspondence. Um, not all of it in English, some of it in Cyrillic. It is communicating with the former Soviet states. I can't read Cyrillic, so uh, I will s happily show those. Um, and if there's somebody in chat who can tell us what they say, great. Otherwise, I'm not sure how good we will do with those. Um, let's see, the Anne Eve Moss papers, which we have looked at on stream, but I pulled them because there is um, uh, there are some uh, personal correspondence items in there. The Lucy Herndon Crockett papers. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Lucy Herndon Crockett was a Red Cross worker during World War II um, and was a speechwriter and secretary for the chairman of the American Red Cross. She wrote nine books, was an illustrator and designer, and one of her books um, was made into the film The Proud and the Profane. Uh, we do have some correspondence from her. <clears throat> the Welford D. Taylor collection on Sherwood Anderson includes communications between Taylor and Anderson. As I said, we have lots of Sherwood Anderson stuff. Uh, and then the Mary Sinton Leach correspondence with J.J. Lankies. Um, Leach was an author um, or editor. Editors and authors were... Uh, had similar work uh, with regard to newspapers and magazines in the late 1800s. So anyway, she was an author, but she was also an editor um, <clears throat> for several magazines and newspapers in the 1800s, uh, founder and co-president of the Poetry Society of Virginia. Um, and yeah, so I have correspondence from her as well. So that is all available. You can look at that list at any time. It has links to um, other uh, to the finding aids for each of those. So if you want to see any more specifics, um, that is available for you. But I think it's time that I start moving over to sharing some documents. Um, <clears throat> so if anything jumped out at you from that listing, do let me know and I will prioritize it so that we get to it at uh, the top end rather than the latter end of the stream. <clears throat> because otherwise I'm just going to pull things off, off of my cart and we'll see what they are. I'm trying to remember which one it was. You all just... Um, it wasn't the Lillian Gish. Since you mentioned visiting the uh, Catherine Ann Porter archives, I thought maybe I would try to find that letter first. But now I've forgotten which collection it's in. 
<laughs> so give me one second to scroll back up and find it. Uh, the date and color papers. <clears throat> All right, I have an entire box for this one. A lot of the others, I just pulled folders. Well, I pulled entire boxes. The boxes are downstairs though, and I have the folders up here. <clears throat> but this one, um, all of this is correspondence uh, up until here. This is all correspondence. Um, <clears throat> and in there are letters with various personages, including um, Catherine and Porter. And yes, uh, thank you, Mubot, for the announcement. Um, I doubt that you have announced it over here, so let me do that as well. Um, but yes, uh, I do have a survey that uh, asks some really quick questions about what you think of the stream. If you've already filled it out, thank you much. Uh, if you have not, um, it would be appreciated because it will help me to explain to other people here what I do and why I do it. and. Um, why it has value and I should be allowed to continue doing it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, there. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of letters. I have not personally looked through it. So let me, as with basically every episode, I have gone to the lengths of identifying a theme pulling materials on that theme and <clears throat> looking through them for something visually interesting enough to create a promotional graphic out of. And that is the extent of my preparation for the stream. Uh, unless it is a collection that I personally processed, I basically know nothing about it beyond what's in the finding aid. And we get to discover together, A, how accurate the finding aid is, and B, what's in the collection. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah. Demonstrate the value! Indeed, indeed. Uh, so let's see. If I, I'm not going to read letters until we see a name we recognize, because we're talking notable or famous people today. So if it's not a name that I know or that one of you knows, we're not reading the letter. So this one is Gay Wilson. Allen. Uh, I am not familiar with Gay Wilson Allen. Walter Allen. Another one that I do not know. Um, this one is Sherwood Anderson. It is, as you can see, it has been encased in a mylar sleeve. Um, I could pull it out, but I don't think the glare is so bad that I need to. Uh, it doesn't seem overly shiny. So I think we're good without me taking it out of the Mylar sleeve. Uh, I will try and zoom in a little bit. And y'all can help me decipher his handwriting here. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Kohler, Keeler, Kaler, Kohler, Collar. There are so many different ways I have heard this name spelled. It's K O H L E, or said. It's K O H L E R. I do not know specifically how this person pronounced their name. Um, and I'm going with Kohler because that is the one that my brain defaults to. Uh, and it is a legitimate pronunciation for the spelling. I just don't know what, how they actually said their name. <clears throat> I am at a luau to I am at a luau to something.
I see help to I'm, I'm wondering if this is send help, although there doesn't appear to be a D at the end of that word, so I have no idea. Um, let me see what else it says. It will depend. No, is it is it Luau? I swear it looks like Luau, but I think it is, I think it might be loss. Deciphering handwriting, this is fun. I was like, maybe he's in Hawaii. Uh, but no, I don't think it says Luau. I think it says loss, which. Oh, yep. Realizing that that says loss instead of Luau, uh, I now have, I am at a loss to know how I can help. It will depend, won't it, on getting people of talent who know something about college life to write on it. Sincerely, Sherwood Anderson. <clears throat> I got there in the end. I honestly thought that that word was luau. It looks like an L-U-A-U. -U. Um, and so then it was okay, the next words don't make any sense, the, I can't even make out the letters, until I got to the next paragraph and I was, it will depend, won't it? And I was like, okay, Luau doesn't seem relevant to that. And in such a short letter, they should have some consistency. So then I went back and re-examined it and, and got it. Uh, anywho. <clears throat> Out of context, everyday letter from Sherwood Anderson, the noted American author, to Mr. Kohler, an English professor here at Virginia Tech, I believe, yes. It is undated, I don't know the date. Um, hey, look, I could have looked at the photocopy that was the next page in here where somebody had kindly uh, already figured out what it said. And they also have a note here. Oh dear, I went um, one closer than I meant to there. <clears throat> Mr. Kohler said the letter was written uh, circa 1928. <laughs> so, you know, great. I'm sad it wasn't about a luau. Let's see, Max Apple, Harriet Arn Arnaud, don't know that person. Ray Atchison, if any of these names ring a bell and you'd like me to read the letter, let me know. Uh, Louis Ald, Steve Barney, Eric Batson, from the Shaw Society. Shaw. Uh, Eric Batson at the Shaw Society. And, oh wow, attached to a manuscript with an essay about Bernard Shaw. Um, lots of communications from this Eric Batson person. Let's skip over that until we Jonathan Bombach, James F. Beard Jr. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, I will share. It's a name I recognize, at least. Oh, okay, so this is not the same James Beard. 
I don't think. This is an American literature professor rather than, um, we have a lot of James Beard things, so that's, I, my brain immediately went to um, the noted chef and uh, cookbook author, but sadly, this seems to be an American English professor. <laughs> So, sorry to tease you for a moment, uh, thinking that this was the chef. Is that the food beard? Um, sadly, no. Uh, well, see, now I need to know. James Beard uh, is apparently not James F. Beard. It's uh, James A. Beard, uh, James Andrew Beard, is the really famous uh, food James Beard. We have a number of like cookbooks and other things um, by James Beard. Todd Bender, Eric Bentley, we came close, Mildred Bennett. More Mildred Bennett. Ron, someone, Berman, Ron Berman, not, lots of names I don't know in this first folder. We could target the ones that were highlighted in the finding aid. Uh, just Blotner, Philip Booth, Lawrence Bowling. This would be easier if this collection was by or about specifically a famous person. Unfortunately, this person just corresponded with the famous people. All right. I think we're going to do targeted searches through this collection then. Uh, where the one to Ohio State University, Shadows of Life, I will look. Um, because I don't remember where that one was, but I will find it. UCSD. All right, let's see. Syracuse. Louisiana State, Bryn Mawr, Texas Tech, University of Alabama, Northern Colorado. I believe that you saw one in here. I just don't know how far back I have to go to find it. All right, we're gonna get this. Stan Stamford. Shaw Society, we were definitely past that. UVA, Columbia, UCSD. I'm not sure which one you're meaning. Where is it? It was before this. All right, we're going back to the beginning here. Alan, Alan. Then we've got the Sherwood Anderson letter that we looked at and read and that I was sad wasn't about Luau's. Reed College. I don't see Ohio State in here. But maybe I'm looking at the wrong things. Maybe I'm looking at letterhead and I should be looking at addresses. It was a small piece of paper. All right. I will, the context will help me locate it. Um, 
This is the having a delay for chat. Um, Eric Batson. This is all the <clears throat> Shaw Society stuff. Oh, there it is. It was hiding behind the Shaw Society things. Um, let's see. This is from Jonathan Bombach. So, stuck to one for New York University. Okay. The Ohio State University Department of English. I need to zoom in a little because I can't see that. Now we get to see if I remember how to zoom in. <laughs> All right. Nope. I have gone the wrong direction with this. Was not worth it. Hello. Thank you so much for the 12 month resubscription. Uh, no need to apologize. I'm, had to, I'm happy to see you. How are things for you? Um, I hope you have been enjoying or I was going to say enjoying yourself, but also I just hope you've been able to relax. Um, I hope I hope things have been good. Um, the Ohio State University Department of English. Uh, this was addressed to Dayton Kohler. Uh, Dear Mr. Kohler, thank you for the check and the offer of doing some reviews for next year's annual. I'd be interested in reviewing the Saul Bellows Herzog. Edward Lewis Wallant's Children at the Gate, Ralph Ellison's new novel, and Peter Taylor's Miss Leonora, When Last Seen. Sincerely, Jonathan Baumbach. Um, there's a bunch of handwritten notes all over it, which is probably what caught, you, caught your eye. Unfortunately, I don't know what most of them are, other than that in the middle there is a phone number in New York City. Um, I have no idea when those handwritten notes were added. The letter itself is from March of 1964. But I'm guessing this sat on his desk and he just like took like handwritten notes on it. It's as good as it gets because you're at work. I understand that. I do. I say as I am actively doing something for work that I actually enjoy doing. Uh, what is the form for? So then later, this like documents his career change, if nothing else in the collection does, probably something else does. But in March of 64, he was at the Ohio State University. And in November of 64, he was at New York University. Um, so I, I hope I was able to give you what you wanted from that Shadows of Life. Oh, OSU is what you saw first, like the, the name of the school. I mean, that stands out, yeah. All right. Uh, what were the specifics? So we saw the Sherwood Anderson letter that was mentioned. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Catherine Ann Porter are the two others in this collection that I know exist. Uh, so I'm going to prioritize jumping to those, uh, which should be F and P. There might be others in here, but I don't know who they are, because these are the only three names that were specifically called out in the finding aid. Um, so let's see. And all of these other letters, I'm sure, are quite interesting. It's just that today we're focused on everyday letters of famous people or notable people. <clears throat> these other people quite possibly notable in their own right, but if we don't recognize their names, I don't have enough time in two hours for us to focus on everybody. All right, uh, is this closer or further away? That was closer and I wanted further away. There we go. I don't know that I will ever get used to that, although it should make sense. I move further out when I move to the left and further in when I move to the right on that control. Anyway, uh, we have an item here on the Hotel Rennert uh, letterhead. And again, you can see this has been put into a mylar sleeve because this is an item that people want to see. It's an item that 
um, just has general interest and so gets handled more than just about anything else in the collection. And so it's in the sleeve to help protect it um, more than we otherwise would because it, it just gets more handling. Um, Mr. Dayton Kohler, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Blacksburg, Virginia. Dear Mr. Kohler, here with the M MS Ms. I, I'm uncertain. It appears to be an abbreviation, but I would expect a capital, I don't know, Ms. could be, anyway. Yes, Shadows, I'm gonna get there. Here with the Ms. have checked certain things on the side. Manuscript! Ah, <laughs> So, and you'll note there's the ENC at the bottom to indicate enclosure. Here with the manuscript. Uh, have checked certain things on the side that if you ever have occasion to use it, you can use in correction. Hope to God I finish my novel this summer. Most cordially yours, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, this was a letter from April 28th, 1932. And I do not know. So I do know um, Dayton Kohler He was a professor, but uh, just from the things that I've seen, I believe he did um, yeah, he did literary essay reviews. Um, he did other kinds of, of things like that. Um, so authors would communicate with him because he would provide feedback and edits for their manuscripts. Um, I'm just curious, F. Scott Fitzgerald, 1932, what book would this have been about? Oh, you gotta give me like a list form bibliography. This was after Great Gatsby. Um, so yeah, I, this probably, and I cannot guarantee, but probably since it references working on a book or a novel rather than short stories, um, this was probably his fourth book, Tender is the Night. Uh, that this is about. There is, hey, thank you for referring me to the tools in front of me when I went out and looked up the information myself. I'm so used to like processing collections where I don't have provided information and I just have to come up with it my, uh, my, on my own. Yes, the note that was with it, which I'm sure came from the seller because there's no way this was donated. Well, I don't know, it could have been. No, okay, this is a professor's paper, so this would have been donated, not purchased. So this note is probably from Mr. Kohler. And indeed, if I would read, I would see, <clears throat> Mr. Kohler gave the following information. Fitzgerald was returning a manuscript of an article that Kohler had written about Fitzgerald. The novel to which Fitzgerald refers is Tender is the Night. You know, if I... Also, hi, Fluid Anne. Thank you for directing me to the note that if I would have just read, I would have had the information I was trying to figure out. Um, since we're in this folder, I'm going to flip through and see if anybody else's name pops out. No, no, I'm not, because we've already spent a half an hour. And I did just discover uh, in my document that I linked to all of you, I have less of the names. Uh, than are actually in the finding aid. So there are some others I can pull out too. Um, but. K. 
Catherine Ann Porter. That is the one that we started with this trying to find. And I have, uh, oh, look at this. This is neat. Isn't that just a, an archives mood? Oh, look at this. This is neat. Um, it's, it's big. It's tall. It is longer than the folder. Um, therefore, it has been folded slightly. I'm going to zoom out. Nope. That is in. We're going all the way. So you can see the big tall, I don't know whose letter this is, Dale Nichols, who I don't think is fits our definition of notable person. But look at it, it's so pretty. I had to pay attention to it. So we're gonna read it. Um, Tucson, Arizona, February 9th, 1943. Long letter is long. Um, I wonder if Dale Nichols is an author. Let's find out. Is there a, an American author by the name of Dale Nichols by any chance? Uh, Dale. Since that seems to be most of what's in here. No, artist. Paintings. And, and uh, the search engine, when I put in the name Dale Nichols, suggested artist. So he fits our definition of notable person. Wow, that's tiny script, though. I cannot read that. Uh, Dale Nichols was an American painter and illustrator known for his depictions of prairie landscapes in the American Midwest. Nichols painted barns and snow-covered haystacks in a smooth, simplified style of naturalism similar to that of American regionalists Grant Wood and Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, Company for Supper, 1948, Partners, 1950, and The Evening Mail, 1968, exemplify his detailed, affectionate portrayals of rural life. Born on July 13, 1904 in David City, Nebraska, he went on to study at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts and became the first Carnegie Visiting Professor of Art at the University of Illinois. He died in 95 in Sedona, Arizona. He has works in the Smithsonian, um, the Art Institute of Chicago, ne Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, and just because uh, Artnet includes images. I will pull one of those up and we can at least get an example. Company for Supper, Partners, or the Evening Mail. I was going to pull up one of his iconic ones if I could find it. Uh, really? You're. The last one has got to be one of his color ones, right? Now I'm muttering to myself and you're all staring at um, a non-moving thing, aren't you? Um, evening star, evening chores. At least on this page, they don't have one of his iconic ones, known as the Evening Mail. For what it's worth, he did not finish it until the fall of 33 rather than summer of 32 when the, oh, uh, talking about the F. Scott Fitzgerald. That makes, uh, yeah, cool, thank you. Um, okay, I don't know why I was trying to like pick something specific. The person that we are, um, looking at a letter from is Dale Nichols, artist. And here are some examples of his art. Just to, in case you were not familiar with him, um, I think I've seen his art style before, but I was not specifically familiar with him. Um, yeah. 
this is one of the ones that they called out as his, uh, as exemplifying his style. Okay, so let's see what the letter says. Wishfully thinking he would finish it soon. No, no, it's fine was not worth it. Uh, I was just, I read the comment and wanted to, um, since I read it out loud, I wanted to recontextualize it for anybody who was just listening. So, so the letter itself, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that you all can see the text larger in. Yes, I picked the right one. Um, I can zoom further if, if you wish, but this sort of gets you as much of the text in one go as possible. Dear Mr. Kohler, I am deeply pleased to know that you enjoy my paintings. Each of my works represent an adventure, a personal adventure of the spirit, and I like to feel that I am sharing my experiences with others. Three large reproductions have been published and can be obtained from the Rudolf Leach Company. Uh, these are The End of the Hunt, Company for Supper, Twilight in Alaska. Smaller reproductions can be had from the American Art Artists Group Incorporated, uh, who have published about seven subjects as Christmas cards. Other uh, reproductions from Abbott Laboratories, North Chicago, Illinois, and the Thomas D. Murphy Company, Red Oak, Iowa. Incidentally, I've illustrated two years before the Mass for the Heritage Club. Sorry, I parsed that sentence incorrectly. Incidentally, I have illustrated two years before the mast for the Heritage Club. Best wishes from Dale Nichols. Let's see, University College of Wales, J.M. Noseworthy. Not a name that I'm particularly familiar with as being a famous personage that I should know, but Interesting, okay. Um, yeah, University College of Wales, look at that letterhead. I will not attempt to pronounce the Welsh. Still more from Noseworth, who I'm unfamiliar with. Joyce Carol Oates. I believe that is a person that would fit our notable person. Let's find out. Yep, American writer, Joyce Carol Oates. Um, published her first book in 1963, has published 58 novels, a number of plays and novellas, short stories, poetry, nonfiction, uh, Blackwater, What I Lived For, and Blonde, and her short story collection, The Wheel of Love, and Lovely Dark Deep Stories, were finalists for the Pulitzer, has won many awards, including the National Book Award uh, for her novel, Them, two O. Henry Awards, and the National Humanities Letter, and the Jerusalem Prize. Um, and here we have a letter from her to Kohler in 1966, 58 novels, yes. Uh, David Madden suggested that I write to you about payment for a piece I did on RV Castle for master plots. I can't remember exactly when I sent it in. I guess about six months or so ago, perhaps more. All best wishes, Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> Like, this totally fits the everyday letters of notable people. Um, because it is just, hey, I did a short thing, can you pay me? Uh, just, you know, checking on, on the payment stuff for the thing that I did. Not, like, sharing snippets of writing or asking for feedback. Just literally, can I have payment for that short thing? Thing that I sent. I love it. 
Um, and then we have another one from Joyce Carol Oates in October of 66. Uh, Dear Mr. Kohler, quite some time ago I sent in for Master Plots via David Madden a review of R.V. Castle's The Father. I never received any notification of your accepting or rejecting this essay. Will you please reply to this letter? If the essay has been accepted, I assume I will be paid for it. If not, please return it to me. Sincerely, J.C. Oates. <laughs> Send check, please. Okay, thanks, bye. Uh, essentially, yeah. Like, I love it. Um, I no idea who this is from. It just, somebody Owens, I don't know. And somebody has handwritten Owens on there and I can't. Oh, it's Guy Owen. who was apparently an author, but not one I'm familiar with, and I'm gonna move on. Because uh, there's a lot more stuff to look at. Uh, unless you all want me to look at the Guy Owen things, and in which case I will. Um, Stanley Plumley. That is a name that I actually do recognize. But I don't really know why I recognize Stanley Plumley's name. I think he might have been a literature critic. Hmm. But uh, we now have the item that sent us to this folder in the first place. The letter from Catherine Ann Porter. As you can see, it is blue. Um, which on camera... The black on blue is really hard to see. I will zoom in so that the text is larger uh, because with this color combination, larger text will be more helpful for people. Um, oh, you saw another Ohio University? Yeah, Stanley Plumley. Again, referencing David Madden, book reviews. I mean, if, if you're interested in Ohio University stuff, I'm, I'm fine looking at this. I just need to look up who Stanley Plumley was. A poet, American poet. Um, I knew I recognized the name, I just didn't know why. I did not study um, classics or English or like, I was not a literature person. Uh, that was not me. Many of my colleagues studied literature. Um, anyway, Stanley Plumley, author of numerous collections of poetry, including In the Outer Dark, winner of the Delmore Schwartz Memorial Award and Out, uh, and Out of Body Travel nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Other works include Giraffe, 1973, Summer Celestial, 1983, Boy on the Step, 1989, The Marriage in the Trees, 1997, and Now That My Father Lies Down Beside Me, New and Selected Poems, 1970 to 2000, 2000, Against Sunset, 2017, and the posthumous Middle Distance, 2020. Really? You worked with Stanley Plumley once briefly for a conference? I mean, he is notable. He has, he's an award-winning poet. Um, he was notable enough that I recognized his name even if I didn't know why. Uh, I was just like, this is the only collection we have looked at so far. Um, and there are more. So that, that was the only reason I wasn't gonna focus here. Uh, dear Mr. Kohler, in close, you find the belated and apparently ill-fated Snyder Review. I hope this copy has made it through. I had to type it myself, hence there are a few insertions. I couldn't resist having the chance to make further revisions. 
This one is about half the length of the first. Uh, for some reason, I didn't think I owed the QNITS review with the other two. In fact, I was surprised when you paid me for it. I'm sending it out tomorrow. Having no secretarial help this summer only adds to my general slowness. Thanks for your patience under such harried circumstances. Sincerely, Stanley Plumley. P.S. Would you send me a copy of Harry Taylor's review of my book when it appears? Uh, apparently, Stanley Plumley worked at Ohio University. Uh, May 23rd, 1971. Dear Mr. Kohler, enclosed, you find the Donald Hall review. The Gary Snyder piece should be here by t should be there by Friday. Uh, the Snyder piece was originally twice the size of this one. That was simply too enormous. Also, I'm afraid I may have overquoted in the Hall piece. The problem here was the rather large spectrum of work Hall included. I felt compelled to at least touch all the bases. Sorry to have been such so much bother to you. Thank you for your patience and kindness. Sincerely, Stanley Plumley. These are not about his poetry. So, okay. They fit the theme. May 17th, 1971. Dear Mr. Kohler, thank you for the phone call and for the review of my book. Poetry, as you know, receives little enough attention. Reviewing seems to be its most effective means of popularization. I was kindly noticed in a recent Saturday review, April 3rd, bits and pieces of mail are still coming in about it. All of which is background for the fact that the two reviews I'm pro I've promised you are being typed. I'm simply too slow on this little Olivetti. Oh, an Olivetti. Um, and since I didn't get the material to her until today, Monday, the typist says she'll need till Wednesday anyway to finish, to finish off. Uh, I'll get them off to you special delivery. The QNITS piece should be soon to follow. I spent my first 10 years in Winchester, Virginia, so I know how beautiful the spring can be down there. Hope you are enjoying it. Sincerely, Stanley Plumley. That could be another reason why I know who he, who he is, because I lived in Winchester for a while. Um... An Olivetti is a type of typewriter. Um, there's Ohio University and Ohio State University. And this is Ohio University, not the Ohio State University. And not uh, Miami University of Ohio. Likely not to be um, confused there. I will hydrate, Lord Portico. Thank you. All right, November 26, 1970. Dear Mr. Kohler, received your letter yesterday. I hope you are feeling better now. I would very much enjoy doing the Kunitz volume and probably the Donald Hall volume. I think we're reading these in reverse chronological order. Although I am a great fan of Gary Snyder's. Uh, frankly, you make the choice that best suits your needs. If it does not sound too piggish, I might just as well handle all three volumes. Robinson Jeffers is one of those poets I grew up with. I think I would rather avoid him now. I am right now finishing a review of Alone with America, a book that has to be the Moby Dick of poetry criticism. Being able to focus on one poet at a time will be a welcome relief. And would you please send along a suggestion about length of review, etc.? Hope soon to hear from you, Stanley Plumley. Kohler worked at both Ohio University and Ohio State University. And, I, I don't know, he was in a, a lot of English departments, it seems. Uh, but these letterheads, these are letters to him, so he, he's got letterhead from everywhere. Rather than these being letters from him. Um, yes, so this one is in Mylar. I'm going to try not taking it out of the Mylar, uh, but I do want to make sure that it is legible on screen. I can see it, um, but if the contrast between the text and the blue page is um, difficult to make out, A, I will read out loud, uh, B, you can let me know and I will zoom in further to make the text even larger. Um, I think a part of the reason why I separated this from the folder um, was because I think having the manila folder 
and the white papers behind it was actually making the blue look darker on screen and making it harder to make out. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so we have a letter from April 1966, um, return address in Washington, D.C., Dayton Kohler, Esquire. Uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, College of Arts and Sciences, Department of English and Foreign Languages, Blacksburg, Virginia. Dear Mr. Kohler, your review of, I zoomed up too far. That was me literally moving the page up too far. I apologize. Your review of Ship of Fools in your annual review is one of the best, clearest, most understanding one I have seen. I have been amazed at some of the interpretations, bad guesses at motives, total misunderstanding, and above all, the tone of personal rancor that seemed to dirty, seemed like dirty water through some of the critical estimates. The most common mistake of these run-of-the-mill reviewers is to ascribe the views and behavior of the author's characters to the author himself. The question most often asked me by students and random readers is, after, where do you get your ideas? Where are you in the book? Which character do you represent? My answer is considered either flippant or evasive or just downright deception. I tell them that I am everybody on board ship from the seasick bulldog to the captain of the bridge, the fat man in the cherry colored shirt and who sang, him, who sang and made mischief, and uh, the deported sugar workers in the steerage. In fact, I am the ship too, and I suspect even the ocean and the islands in the sea. For I wrote the book and all of my living substance is in it. All I had to give at the time. And this mere simple fact of what working in an art means is incredible to them. They cannot grasp even the margins of this central principle. I wonder sometimes why they insist on in invading territories that will be strange to them always, and yet it never seems to occur to them that they have missed a point or failed to see the meaning of the work they abuse. Thank you profoundly for your essay and for sending me the annal. I hope to see more of your work. I wish you well in the long, uh, I wish you well in a long life of good work. Sincerely yours, Catherine Ann Porter. So a thank you letter for what she considered to be a good review, a well done review, uh, where she had felt hard done by, let's say, um, the previous or other reviews she had seen. Uh, this seems to have been <clears throat> specifically the book Ship of Fools by Catherine Ann Porter. Yeah, that one's pretty cool. I like that one. Um, I mean, we were looking for everyday letters, and that was very much a professional letter. So it did not fit the theme, but anyway. Reynolds Price, I don't know who that is. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can locate a couple of the others, um, because there were some other names mentioned on this collection, but they weren't, they were in a different sentence in the finding aid. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can find them. Uh, what have I done? What have I done? I lost the finding aid. Hang on. <laughs> um, there we go. There we go. I know I saw their names. Willa Cather, Conrad Richter, Carl Sandberg, James Still, Jesse Stewart. Um, I don't know if they are in these letters or not. It just says, among the noted authors most prominently featured in the collection are. So I don't know if they're in the correspondence or not. We will find out by looking for Willa Cather. Kenneth Cameron. I think it might be, cause I got another mylar sleeve. It is. 
All right, I have um, I have some correspondence here from Willa Cather. Uh, we have arranged it in such a way that it should be possible to view fairly easily without. I, all, I even have a trans. Somebody has already transcribed it. It's so lovely. Makes it so much easier. Although I'm sure you love watching me struggle to read people's handwriting on screen. On stream. Um, move this out of the way. Uh, in case people do not know who Willa Cather is. Again, an author. American writer, known for her novels of life on the Great Plains, including O Pioneers, The Song of the Lark, and My Antonia. Or My Antonia. I'm not certain exactly how that is meant to be pronounced. Um, but yeah, bunch of bunch of novels and some short fiction and some poetry. Active uh Actively publish, it, publish novels between 1912 and 1940. Short fiction between 1905 and 1972. Anywho. Uh, my dear Mr. Kohler. March 16th, 1939. My dear Mr. Kohler. What is the use? Hitler entered Prague last night. Um, I, content warning, historical, just, these are historical documents about historical events and history. Um, this mentions Hitler, the German invasion of Poland in March of 1939, just as a heads up. I did not know until I started reading. So yeah, if you need to step away and come back after we look at this letter, please do. Take care of yourself. Um, all right, I'm gonna start again. March 16th, 1939. My dear Mr. Kohler, what is the use? Hitler entered Prague last night. President Mas Mas Masaryk was an old friend of mine. Uh, he was a scholar and a lover of letters. In my childhood, I had many Czech friends. I love their way of life. And what about British honor? Which I have always believed in. However much we may try, or sorry, however much, ha, huh. this is a photocopy so you can see the whole letter at once. See, people have already thought ahead of me. It's fine. Uh, <clears throat> however much we may try to live in a nobler past, this thing has come upon and lowers our vitality and our wish to live. Thank you for your kind and friendly letter. Those books were written in better times than this. Sincerely, Willa Cather. That is the only item in here from Willa Cather. I don't know what letters she is thanking him for or uh, what letter she's thanking him for, but um, keeping up with her correspondences while watching the events in Europe unfold. That one's actually one of the most interesting that I've seen in our collection. I didn't know it was here. I, I didn't consciously know it was here. I've seen it before. I just didn't remember it existed. Um, let's see. So that was Willa Cather. Conrad Richter. 
And if anybody knows who Conrad Richter is, can you please tell me, because they're mentioned on here as being a notable part of this collection, but I have no idea who Conrad Richter is. I will, um, <clears throat> you know, pop on over to our wonderful friend Wikipedia to get a little bit of a primer just on who Conrad Richter is. Because Wikipedia is actually great for, I know nothing about this, please give me the basics. Uh, Conrad Richter, born in 1890, died in 1968, American novelists. American novelist whose lyrical work is concerned largely with American frontier. Uh, novels included The Town, The Awakening Land, The Waters of Kronos. Huh. The Waters of Kronos. Got Richardson. I do not believe it was Klingon fiction. Wrote Light in the Forest, which you had to do an essay on in middle school and have resented him ever since. <laughs> I, I can uh, empathize with that, that experience of being forced um, I believe that was my experience with My Antonia uh, by Willa Cather. Here we go. This one's not in uh, the Mylar, but, and we have a couple of items here from Conrad Richter. Wow, we have a lot of stuff here from Conrad Richter. We will not be reading all of these. Uh, the first one, January 14th, 1951. Dear Mr. Kohler, many thanks for sending me a clipping of the Carpenter piece from College English. Yes, I had seen it, but can make good use of the pages you sent. We have taken a house here, bought it and settled down for a time. So far, we are only camping in the house, but hope to have it furnished by next summer, after the spring sales. I have a feeling I said this to you before. Yours sincerely, Conrad Richter. Uh... N.B. I am finishing up final draft of a book, but it is one few something will be interested in. Smells awful? I, I do like the phrase camping in the house. And also, what the, what, where did the, I'm sure you all heard that notification sound that definitely should, ah, not have played because I had all notification sounds turned off. Anyway, uh, you won't hear that anymore. <laughs> I thought I had corrected it after last week. Uh, the weird face I was giving, like, yes, there's a word here that I can't make out. I don't know what it says. NB? What is that an abbreviation for? I'm familiar with postscript, but what is NB? That one I don't know. Also, <clears throat> I'm really curious, because that letter, it sounded like, <laughs> computer, computer, cat, do what want. Yes. Not bene? Hmm. I, where did Conrad Richter go to school? I'm curious. I... If you all want to investigate, and you feel like investigating, um,
Nota bene, meaning note well. You are spot on, key squared. Um, the way that letter was written, this, this first letter here, I think he might have been a student of Kohler's. Thanks for sending me a clipping of the Carpenter piece from College English. I think he may have been a student of Kohler's. Uh, we returned home to find more mail and telegrams than I can easily answer, but I want to acknowledge your kind note of congratulations and thank you uh, for that and the support you have always given my work. With all good wishes to you both, I am yours sincerely, Dayton Kohler. Wait, that was a response. No, yours you're sincerely, Conrad Richter. Wow, brain. I read the wrong name. No schooling past public high school in Ohio. Well, Kohler worked in Ohio teaching English at a university, so it's possible he audited some classes or sat in or something. Um, yeah, anyway, there's a number of letters here from Kohler, but I don't want to linger. We've looked at some everyday letters. I don't want to get into professional letters of Dayton Kohler, or, or not Dayton Kohler, of um, Conrad Richter. Uh, after Conrad Richter, we also have Carl Sandberg, James Still, and Jesse Stewart. Uh, <laughs> Sandberg, Still, Stewart. I love that I can just look for the mylar, and then I know where I'm going. Uh, Oh, you misread, in Pennsylvania, and then moved to Ohio for work. Huh. I, but um, I think we know from the collection, Kohler was very active in Ohio and possibly spent some time in Pennsylvania as well. So it is entirely possible uh, that they would have encountered but sadly, not, not student. Oh, there's a note on the back just saying, this is Carl Sandberg's handwriting on the envelope. Uh, <laughs> but then we do actually indeed have a letter here from Carl Sandberg. Uh, Carl Sandberg, another famous name. Uh, ba, 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 American poet, biographer, journalist, and editor, won uh, three Pulitzer Prizes, um, and one for his biography of Abraham Lincoln. During his lifetime was regarded as a major figure in contemporary literature, especially for volumes of his collected verse, including Chicago Poems, Corn Huskers, and Smoke and Steel. December 16th, 1951, I love that it is on um, letterhead for Connemara Farms. Dear Mr. Kohler, your letter of October 31st is keenly appreciated. It is out of such promptings as yours that fine source material is created. The paragraph about the Libby prison ring has the quality of a brief and highly implicative poem. Sorry, I tripped over that word. The paragraph about the Libby prison ring has the quality of a brief and highly implicative poem. Since your wife knows the location of Connemara and saw in the flesh the Ellington Smith, whom I know only as a ghost, maybe you'll be driving this way sometime and say hello. Yours, Carl Sandberg. Ellington Smith. 
Is that the namesake of Smith Hall? Okay, these are making me do lots of extra searching today. I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Indeed. No. No, this is Ellington and this is Ellison. So, no. I have no idea. But that would be why I, um, the point of Archival Adventures is to go on the adventure with me. Uh, Ellington Smith rung a bell for me, um, but because we have a, na a building here named after Ella's son, Smith, um, Let's see, there's another one here. May 25th, 1953, Dear Brother Kohler, your January letter came brief and rich. The book of plots and plots came, and I thank you, since every ending of one plot is but the beginning of still another plot, and every story inex inexorably has sequels, and there are not yet absolutes in relation to the structure of a novel. Maybe. I should not try to set forth in a letter my extended views on the technique of the novel and of the writing and reading of fiction. Maybe I will see you if eventually I get to writing on those themes, for we have basic fellowship. Ever good wishes and luck stars be over you. Yours, Carl Sandberg. Aw, I love that closing. Ever good wishes and luck stars be over you. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I should have just been like, let's just jump to the things in Mylar <laughs> from the beginning. And then I, I would have jumped straight to the, like, most notable people in the collection. James Still. I do not know why James Still is notable. Who is James Still? Uh, to the Wikipedia, <laughs> because that is my primer. James Still was an American poet, novelist, and folklorist. Lived most of his life in a log house along the Dead Mare, Be uh, Dead Mare, Dead Mare branch of Little Car Creek in Knott County, Kentucky. Best known for the novel River of Earth, which depicted the struggles of coal mining in eastern Kentucky. So we have a letter here that's got some annotations on it, and I'm uncertain who added those. I'm guessing they were added by James Still, and I will I will show why, um, because they appear to be done in the same uh, soft pencil as his signature. Uh, this is not the kind of soft pencil that you use for um, like filling in a Scantron. You know, uh, most people um, ha most people who went through some sort of education system in um, English speaking parts of the world are familiar with Scantrons, at least in the US for sure, are familiar with Scantrons and you, you have to fill them out with a number two pencil. And number two refers to the lead hardness of the pencil. And two is a relatively soft pencil. This is a really soft pencil. <laughs> this is more like a colored pencil, but black in color. Um, so the uh, return is Lit Car, Kentucky. Um, at the top, handwritten, are you writing now? What? Uh, addressed to Dayton. Did I know there's a Wikipedia app? I did. I did indeed. Um. <laughs> 
It truly is. I've, I've met some of the people, when I did study abroad in the Netherlands, I've, I met a couple of people who actually worked for Wikipedia. Um, and it's remarkably reliable for getting basic information on a subject. And then you can use the uh, references that are listed because they, they have to list a source. Um, so you can, if you need to dig further, you can go to those sources. And um, so yeah, as, as just a good starting point for learning about a topic, it, it's good for getting the basics out of the way. Uh, Dayton. Nothing escapes your reading eye. How deep in the papers did you find word of the award? At insistence of Viking and the donors, I went to New York City on my way, took the flu. Uh, for three days, it was flu on the hoof. I longed for a bed wherein to let my head ache in peace. I got my feet wet in the city's black snow. I went sniffing and snuffing and sneezing. At the luncheon, everybody made speeches. I said not a word. Then I hustled home, fast as ever I could, and to bed. And now I am fully well. I have just had a letter from Catherine Ann Porter. She has bought 105 acres of a farm in New York State near Saratoga Springs and intends living there. I ask myself, what if her, practic what if her practically new husband away down in Louisiana? She is happy about the house and land, described it to the extent of about 500 words. What is your mental climate these days? Hope the young son and its mother are doing fine. James Still. My cats, Timothy and Roger. Equals no mice. I love the little, the, the little, Bad sketches of cats. I love it. It doesn't seem like he was embarrassed about drawing those cats. And this is very much an everyday letter. This is just a, I know you heard about the award I got. I got sick when I went to go pick it up. I got a letter from Catherine. She bought a house. But it's written so eloquently and has such musicality to it. Um, if I didn't know he was a poet, I would suspect he was a poet. Just from the way he wrote this everyday letter. Um, <clears throat> another James Still. It's a Christmas card from James Still. Merry Christmas and best wishes for a happy new year. Thank you to the, thank you for the Engel and Hangland Poets Choice and absolutely first class anthology. The only flow is self-inclusion of, the only flaw is self-inclusion of one of editors. Wish you were by to talk about KAP's Ship of Fools. Another reference to Catherine Ann Porter. From Jim. And this one from Key West, down in Florida. Dear Mr. Kohler, here I am at the tag end of nowhere. I go traipsing up and down the streets of this odd town, pulling leaves off strange trees. A few have names on them. Capoc, Geiger, Sandbox, Spanish Laurel, Cork, Sepadilla, Lime, Royal uh, Poinciana. The Sandbox is a tree with horns. Great locks of rootlets hang out of the Spanish Laurel like a woman's hair. From the first sentence, your splendid review pleased me. One thing is certain about our regional literature, the genuine product is always homemade. I liked the whole of it. I am grateful. A copy will be sent to the Viking Press. 
About a week ago, I spent a day with Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, driving through the big scrub in central Florida. I judge you saw Marjorie's recent article on regional writing in a recent issue of English Journal. Elizabeth Maddox Roberts has invited me to visit an hour with her next week at Orlando. She has now recovered from her long illness, and I'll be happy to see her well again. Uh, Lester Hemingway, brother to Ernest, lives in this house. He writes too, I understand. He had never heard of me. The world is large. On the way down here, I witnessed a killing at Jackson, Kentucky. I witnessed, I missed the tornado at Albany, Georgia by one half hour. My best wishes to Mr. Hatfield. I'll return to Kentucky in about two weeks. Your book will be inscribed and returned to you then. Sincerely, John S James Still. You misheard K-pop as K-pop. <laughs> um, wow. Again, a completely everyday letter written by somebody who just has music in his writing. Like, he is a poet, and it is clear just from this. Um, but also, unexpected things. I apologize for the blasé mention of witnessing a murder toward the end or and for the uh you know the close call with the tornado i did not know those would be in there this is a cool letter that one that one's pretty neat um i am going to there are probably more in this collection and i'm going to actually show off something other than this collection to justify why the stream has the name it has, rather than just being letters from the color collection. <laughs> so, we're gonna look at Henry James now. Do, do you know who Henry James is? If you don't, I'm going to do as I have done with all of these other people and give you a brief bit of info. Uh, <clears throat> Henry James was a novelist and short story author. Um, uh, most recognized works are Daisy Miller, A Study, Portrait of a Lady, and The Bostonians, according to information. I didn't recognize any of those personally. Uh, what did I recognize from his bibliography? Major novels. Portrait of a Lady, Roderick Hudson. Portrait of a Lady, Princess... Uh, no, I don't recognize any of them, apparently. I don't know his work. I recognize the name. I feel bad. I feel like I'm supposed to know his work, but also I tuned out from like um, American literature and the classics when I realized they were all about um, uh, white guys complaining about how they were um, suffering because uh, they, were slightly different. And they just felt hard done by society. And yeah, when I, when I got that overall meta-narrative for a lot of uh, the vaunted American and British literature, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of done with this. I want to find something more diverse. So, but that was my personal experience. Anyway, this letter is from Henry James. Uh, <clears throat> addressed, let's see, March 22nd, 1889. Uh, Dear Lady Grace Barking, it will give me very great pleasure to
I'm not sure what that word is. To something, write you on Thursday, April 11th. But I don't know what word that is. Um, it doesn't make sense. It, it looks like it could be come, but that doesn't make sense. There's a dot, which implies there's an I. Dine with. I got it. I got it. Uh, <clears throat> Dear Lady Grace Barking, it will give me very great pleasure to dine with you on Thursday, April 11th. Um, something yours very truly, Henry James. I don't know what this word is. I'm <clears throat> fairly certain that we have transcribed these at some point, but the transcriptions are not in the folder, and I'm not 100% certain where they're located. I wish I knew what that word was. I think it's believe. Believe yours very truly. Strange phrasing, but based on this other letter that has basically the identical word and seems to actually be the word believe. Um, all right, uh, this one is Dear Mrs. Sheridan, just a word to thank you for your most kind note and assure you of the pleasure with which I will present myself on Monday afternoon in the train, or rather, literally speaking, uh, thy motor of Mrs. Wharton, a dear Oh, Mrs. Wharton and dear Howard, I immensely appreciate the delightful opportunity, I think. Immensely I, I might not be correct there. Yeah, I still don't know. I'm still not certain if this is believe or not. Something. Your most truly Henry James. That's from 1909, June 26th. I wish I could make it out. I just don't know. Looking at the others to see if they give me any, and they don't really give me any sense. Um, you know, I'm not gonna dwell on it. It's a closing. I just don't know what word it is. <clears throat> Next, we have a letter here from 1892, it looks like. May 4th, 1892. Dear sir, I shall be very Happy to I shall be very to something a for may realize it, many have, placed on the list of, hmm, 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 let me see. If, if there 
is a transcription or something else like that, the finding aid may direct me to it. Because I, this one I'm just not getting at all. <clears throat> and there's not a link. Some of these, I'm not sure why they're not scanned. <laughs> I feel like they should be scanned. Um. Nope. It's possible that we have digital versions of these, but if we do, they are in places where I cannot find them immediately. And I don't know what this one says. The handwriting is very difficult. Dear sir, I shall be very uh, happy to... Placed on the list of stewards at the Met annual dinner. No, I don't know if that's Met. At the next annual dinner of the Society of Authors. Yours most truly, Henry James. Nope, no idea. I, th there's a whole segment of words in there that I just, no clue. Um, but then we have this one that um, is even more challenging. Because not only is the handwriting the same handwriting that I've been struggling with, uh, but it bleeds through the page and gives the effect of cross-hatching without actually being cross-hatching. Um, so this is uh, Henry James to George Gissing, 1903, it looks like. Um, the beginning of the letter I have yet to locate. The end of the letter is here. This is his signature. And if I trace back from there, uh, we get to the edge here and then flip. And I think it continues here and then goes here. And then back here and up, what I don't know it may start here, but I'm not I'm not certain it starts at the top here. I'm not even certain this is page one. I think this might be Wait, okay, so somebody has numbered it. This is three. This is four. This is one? No, that's a period. I think we're missing pages one and two. I think there's two pages of this letter that are not here. And we just have pages three and four of a letter. It's neat to look at. I'm not gonna dig through that letter and try and decipher what it says because we have other things we can look at and um, limited time. Anyway, Henry James. Uh, let's see, let's see what we got. Lillian Gish, anyone? Uh, silent film actress. Let's 
so we have a letter addressed to Mr. Charles Haney, University Libraries Humanities Division, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, Blacksburg, Virginia. There's a note in here from Charles Haney, Assistant Humanities Librarian, that says, is dated uh, September 8th, 1978. A patron had asked the source of a quotation, several lines of poetry, which Griffith was said to repeat as a kind of incantation before telling the cameras to roll. When we had, when we had spent considerable time searching with no result, I wrote to Miss Gish. This is her reply. April 2nd, 1975. Dear Mr. Haney, have just returned from working my way around the world lecturing on film for the Cunard people on board their magnificent Queen Elizabeth II. Hence my delay in answering your question. Not only have I never heard the quote, I never heard Mr. Griffith use it. With every good wish on your Griffith retrospective, most sincerely, Lillian Gish. <laughs> Again. We have, we have letters from famous people about the most mundane things ever. And I love that. It's fun. Um, I want to see if the Buckminster Fuller one. I know I pulled that. Collins. I have so many folders here, y'all. Mm. Ann Moss, Christopher Craft, Buckminster Fuller. So Buckminster Fuller uh, patented the ge geodesic dome. And we have some papers here. I don't know exactly how we got them, why we have them. I mean, we have them because they are engineering related and um, et cetera. I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit. Um, but they're, they're not like, I don't know. They're somehow not as exciting as, as they could be, I think. Um, let's see, so this is, what is this folder called? Letters to and from our Buckminster Fuller. <clears throat> so this one is one uh, from Fuller. November 24th, 1953. Uh, Sending from the Department of Architecture, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Addressed to Tyler Rogers at Owens Corning Fiberglass Co uh, Company in Toledo, Ohio. Dear Tyler, as you will see by the schedule attached, I am not at the University of Minnesota conducting one of a series of my university and college seminars. I'm, I zoomed out. And I wanted to zoom out, now I want to zoom in again, and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, also enclosed is a clipping from the New York Times, November 15, 1953, page 74, which reports on the most recent phase of my design science inquiry at Princeton University, October 1953. The 40 foot diameter tension integrity, a discontinuous compression continuous tension sphere of 90 tabular alu aluminum struts. Uh, individually islanded within a continuous triangulated flexible aircraft cable spherical network. The whole series of seminars comprises a continuing exploration in fundamental structures. I do not engage in class instruction with repetitive, with repetitive curricula. The results of the progressive stages are evolutionary. Each progressive university experiment has provided some degree of advancement in structural performance per units of invested resources. Each seminar has opened for the first time 
uh, prospects of further degrees of technical advantages to be realized only by an individual or a team of individuals through technical initiative and enterprise. Each project is conceived by the individual as uniquely logical for eventual incorporation into the comprehensive pro productive processes of highest priority industry. Okay, that is not an everyday letter. That is very much a professional letter. Let's, let's see if I can find a mundane everyday letter. Corrugated part, cardboard structures, industrial design and interiors. Answering questions. I don't know. Yeah, this seems to all be uh, about the geodesic domes. No, like, private letters, which is sad because we were looking for private letters. Uh... But we can certainly look at the um, geodesic dome stuff another day. For now, I'm going to put this aside. And we're going to look at, let's see, Parker. Let's look at Parker. If I can find it. Professional letters can be very much every day. They're certainly your every day. I, yeah, it's not really the right word term. Word term. It's not the right word term uh, for what I'm trying to distinguish. It really is. I'm trying to focus today on minutia of everyday life as opposed to the thing that they were passionate about. Um, because I thought that was an interesting, and that's what most of these are, is just like calling card letters and stuff like that. And um, did I not pull that one? I swear I did. I don't seem to have one from Parker. The W Parker, W what's his face Parker. W. Dale Parker. I swear I pulled those, but I don't, they apparently did not make it up here um, with me. So sadly, I will not be looking at that. Um, that was the one that had the, the pen pal letters that included Cyrillic and uh, stuff like that. Uh, Lucy Herndon Crockett though. Uh, what was the description I had on these? Oh yeah, this is the World War II Red Cross person. So I have correspondence 1962 to 67 and 79 to 2015. Um, 28 March 1962, 6 p.m. This appears to be a list. I have just completed J. Edgar Hoover's Masters of Deceit and William Z. Foster's Toward a Soviet America. Neither book on U.S. communist activities, it seems to me, has much application to the situation today as we are now launched on the final act in the Soviet's subversive attempt to take over this country without the firing of a single shot, as it promises to happen. Uh, two, Foster's book deals in archaic attitudes and terms Quote, the toiling masses, the bourgeoisie, etc., and categorically confines communist objectives to the sole one of uh, forceful revolution. Hoover's book, manifestly based on extensive first-hand evidence brought to light by the FBI, similarly seems dated, although far from the extreme extent of Foster's. So this seems to be essentially like notes on a book on book reviews comparing two books. I'm not going to read that entire thing because I want to see what else there is. Um, and we are very limited on time now. Um, and because I am not excellent at Spanish, I'm... This one is in Spanish and I'm going to move on simply because I don't have time to try and work out what it says. Um, and I wouldn't... Uh, I, otherwise I would but I just don't have time re remaining in the stream to try that. This one just says nuts. 
Um, oh! I'm wondering if that is a judgment. File, Virginia. Um, <clears throat> this is on attorney letterhead. The Office of the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Addressed January 11th, 1966 to Miss Lucy H. Crockett. Dear Miss Crockett, I have your letter of January 8, 1966, requesting an opinion from this office. You will see from the enclosed card that I am unable to render opinions except to certain specified state officials. I can only suggest that you take the matter up with the Commonwealth's attorney for Smith County. Uh, very truly yours, Robert Y. Button, Attorney General. Um, that is followed by a letter on 12 June, 1966. Uh, I repeat my question, will someone please try to extract from Virginia's lawmaking body the specific rules relating to owning a still? It is quite legal for the private citizen to make all the intoxicating beverage he wishes for non-commercial purposes. He can manufacture by means of all sorts of gadgetry, wines and brandies, etc. Just where does the law specify that he cannot make whiskey? I.e. that we can produce homemade liquor from fruits but not from grains? If the homemade wine distilling gadgetry rigged up were called a still, would that thereupon make this contri contrivance illegal? Signed, Lucy Crockett. Um, and this is, I, I should have said, yeah. I, okay. So that's an interesting question. <laughs> we are getting into a matter of law. This actually is perfect. I, that letter is, is, is perfect to be ending like this. If this is about moonshine, then, then I'm perfectly positioned for uh, the end of this stream. 15 January 1966, addressed to Walter Scott, quote, personality parade, parade. Mr. Scott, may your excellent staff of researchers somehow manage to extract from our Virginia Commonwealth Attorney General some sort of sensible answer to the following. Um, hang on, let me move this. Because we're getting uh, bleed through. Query. Just what is the law in Virginia relative to the home manufacture of, alco uh, manufacture of alcoholic beverage? Apparently, it is permissible for housewives to make all sorts of wines and brandies, but not whiskey. Where does the law draw the line? I refer, of course, to alcoholic drinks produced non-commercially. Please quote the exact law in Virginia specifying where the private citizen is subject to penalty should he experiment in producing whiskey from a still for personal consumption only when the same citizen can produce all the intoxicating brandy he wishes. Signed, Lucy H. Crockett. Oh, sorry, Shadows. Um, <clears throat> oh, this, this, I could not have timed this better had I planned. Um, and you'll find out why. For some reason, there's a pamphlet in here for the Northern Nut Growers Association. bookmarked into this same thing. And on the front it said nuts. I'm confused because that was definitely about moonshine. So I don't know why the moonshine and the nuts are together. Uh, we do have a letter here from April 12, 1967. Um, dear Ms. Crockett, the hazel... I, I, I want to know what happened with the moonshine. Uh, the hazel you have growing locally... This was all part of the same paperclip. The hazel you have growing locally is doubtless the native hazel, uh, Corylus americana. I have grafted it successfully on the Turkish tree hazel, but the resulting shrub is not so long lived as when it uh, as when on its own roots. I do not believe the reverse order would be permanently successful because of the Turkish hazel, 
Because the Turkish hazel is much larger and more vigorous, it would eventually overgrow the American stock to such an extent it could no longer be supported. But this isn't about the whiskey. I want to know about the whiskey. What's going on? Tell me of the whiskey. Um. <gasps> this, this does happen when, uh, when we keep things in original order. Uh, these were probably all paper clipped together when they came to us. And this is more about Turkish hazel. I want to know what happened with the whiskey. I'm sad. Because the next letter is in Spanish again. Uh, if I dig long enough, maybe we would find more about the legal distinction between wine brandy and whiskey in the state of Virginia, which would be interesting. There's stuff here from the, from the ambassador of Turkey, or ambassador for Turkey. This is a collection that I will probably feature at some point. Um, I know very little about Lucy Herndon Crockett, but it seems like a interesting collection. Um, so I will probably feature it at some time. I was looking I thought I would just flip through and see if I could find more on the um, legal status of whiskey. Uh, but so far, no. Um, and, oh, we just got a raid. Hello, 16-Bit Eric. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for bringing the whimsies over. I hope that you had a wonderful stream. Um, I saw that you were doing some Stardew Valley. Uh, if anybody here is not already following 16-Bit Eric, you should definitely do so. Um, we are nearing the end of stream, actually, but it is, it is wonderful to have you. You thought it was an issue of producing whiskey for sale rather than personal consumption? Yeah, but she, she kept writing all these people. There were multiple letters asking for, um, information about it, and no responses. I was hoping there'd be responses. We had the outgoing, but not the incoming. Um, uh, anyway, this is, this is my Wednesday show, everybody, all the, the new raiders, um, where I share materials from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Today we've been focused on... Uh, I, I, I call them in the title Everyday Letters of Notable People. Um, it's sort of like mundane, like the daily minutia. <laughs> there are letters here from that we've seen from Henry James that are uh, confirming that, yes, indeed, he would be happy to luncheon with someone uh, on a given date at a specific time. Um, so that kind of thing, rather than being about the thing that they're known for. Um, and it's been quite interesting. Hi, Iron Trout. It's good to see you. Um, and so right now we're looking at... Uh, so the personal letters of Lucy Herndon Crockett, who was a um, Red Cross worker in World War II and then became a writer um, and had uh, one book made into a movie in 1956. Uh, the book was The Magnificent Bastards and it was about her personal experiences with the U.S. Marine Corps. It was made into the film The Proud and the Profane in 1956. Um, there were some letters where she was writing people asking them if they could point her to the specific law that said that uh, using a still to make whiskey for personal consumption was illegal. Um, and why that was illegal when you could make as much wine and brandy as you wanted for personal consumption and that was perfectly illegal. Uh, hi, Orangitis. Um, but yeah, so we're running up to like, I'm technically a couple minutes over stream, but since you just got here, I wanted to see if there was a letter we might want to read. Um, you know, you all came in with Eric. Therefore, why don't I
pull on out. Oh, this will work. I don't know if these are mundane. I, do, I don't know if these letters are, um, I don't know if these ones are the daily minutia that was the attempted focus of today. But how about we look at the J.R.R. Tolkien letters from the G. Burke Johnston collection. Now, uh, these are letters that were written to Johnston, and these are Johnston's papers that he gave to us. But we only received photocopies of these letters. We do not have originals of these letters. Even though the letters were given to us by the person they were sent to, we only got photocopies. But we'll read them anyway. Uh, so, dear Mr. Johnston, thank you very much for your gift. I think I shall find it of great interest, though at present I have only had time to glance at it. I will put in the corrections you kindly supplied. I expect shortly to be leaving Oxford, but letters would find me care of Mr. Uh, Messrs. Allen and Unwin Limited. Uh, with best wishes, yours sincerely, J.R.R. Tolkien. P.S. With regard to the Trolls song on page 11, root is, or was when I was young, a slang word for kick, especially a hefty kick addressed to a standing object. Uh, the next one, uh, that one was dated uh, May of 1968. The next one, um, Dated 21st August, 1964. Um, I do realize the text on this one is, is a bit faint, but uh, Dear Mr. Burke Johnston, thank you very much for your letter and for your kind words about my books. I await the arrival of Bilbo Niggle and Sting with interest and am grateful for the goodwill. Yours sincerely, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Professor J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, that route could lead to some confusion. Yeah, that... Uh, I agree. And asking for clarification directly from the author, totally a thing. Um, why is... Huh. So there's a letter here from... William Bond, referencing Tolkien, uh, October 9th, 1964. Dear Dr. Johnston, thank you for your letter on, of October 7th. I'd be happy to read your note on Tolkien, but unfortunately I really know nothing about him beyond his published works. I've never met him or corresponded with him, and I know no biographical details. I certainly share your enthusiasms for both The Hobbit and the trilogy. I think they represent an astonishing achievement. Uh, very truly yours, W.H. Bond, Curator of Manuscripts at the Houghton Library in, um, at Harvard. Let's see. I'm curious, what year was that? 1964. So he was getting letters from Tolkien before he contacted the Curator of Manuscripts at Harvard. Um, 21st August, 1964. Yeah, these are exactly, exactly the kind of letters we were hoping to feature on today's show. Like, uh, this is just another, another copy of the one that we just read, but to where, um, oh, this, those are just additional copies. Um, completely, like, yeah, they are sort of about his work, but also... Completely mundane. Complete, like, not, not the type of thing that people are going to jump up and down uh, about finding. Um, the other ones that I have here are not from J.R.R. Tolkien. They are from his daughter, Priscilla Priscilla Tolkien, and I'm trying to find where they start. Uh, but And then that will really be everything that I can do on stream today, because it is... Um, uh, 
I am running just a little over. Uh, so we have a lovely thing here, um, the Tolkien Festival. Department of English, Mankato State College. This is a flyer. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on it because I'm looking for letters. Um, this is from the British Museum, Department of Printed Books. I can't exactly make out the signature on it. 7th November 1969, Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge with thanks the receipt of the undermentioned uh, uh, work which you have been so good as to pre present to the trustees of the British Museum. I, sir, I am, sir, your obedient servant. Um, uncertain what the signature says, but the book in question was um, by George Burke Johnston, The Poetry of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, but then these are the things, let's see. This one, oh, that's page one. And then there's page two. These are, so this is a letter from Priscilla Tolkien. Again, included in the collection are just photocopies of the Tolkien letters, not the originals. But uh, dear professor and Mrs. Burke Johnston, uh, this is the Burke Johnston collection. And these were letters written to him. I'm guessing he decided to keep and or sell the originals and donated copies to us. Uh, <laughs> I am now settling back in at home after my wonderful stories of journeys and meetings in the U.S. or my wonderful series of journeys and meetings in the U.S. and wanted to write and thank you both so much for the pleasure uh, I think it's for the pleasure at the beach party um, at Abingdon last month. The warmth of your welcome on the, er, the warmth of your welcome in the country and curiosity of your er, gifts. I'm, I'm definitely missing some of these words because this handwriting is unique, uh, which I shall always treasure as well as um, my meeting with you both. The conversation that day was delightful, and I was particularly touched by the sonnet written in honor of my father after his death. The links between lovers leaving and scholarship are... far... I'm uncertain. The links between lovers of learning and scholarship are far more difficult to figure out those words. Uh, far stronger than Hmm. Then something or other barriers of time and culture. I, I don't know what this is. And only last night I was talking to a musical friend of mine who said that musical, the musical conversation he enjoyed with composers now dead was often as satisfying as uh, the company of living friends. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is this is lengthier than I had thought, um, and harder to read. I found on my return home a copy of the inaugural lecture 
given in the university last year by the new and first holder of the professorship of English uh, endowed or named, sorry, named after my father. Um, it is an It is an something lecture. I think the new professor is a charming man and a worthy occupant of the position. I am sure. I have ordered a copy of the lecture from the university press and as when it is available, we'll send you a copy. Meanwhile, I do hope you both have a truly memorable trip over here next month. And if you have time to make a telephone call and better still a personal call, please do. But I do realize uh, your time may be extremely limited. So an invitation to call or visit uh, Priscilla Tolkien. Uh, I wish you. Wow. I wish you. Another spot that I just can't make out uh, of, uh, at least not under a time pressure. I could probably figure it out eventually. Uh, huh. Thank you very warmly for your kindness. Very kind regards to you both, Priscilla Tolkien. <sighs> Sorry. I wish I, if, I wish it was easier to make out the handwriting. It's just unique. I have not encountered some of these letter forms before. Uh, P.S. This may not be a view of medieval or renaissance Oxford, uh, but the women's college, including Somerville, has all now had their hundredth birthdays, so are being, so are becoming in their turn quite venerable institutions. Oh, oh boy, this handwriting is really difficult. It doesn't look like it should be difficult, but it is really difficult for me. Anywho, um, yeah, so a couple of like notes here from J.R.R. Tolkien, a couple of notes here, because there are more, from Priscilla Tolkien, his daughter, again, uh, sadly, they did not choose to deposit the originals with us, but they included them with the other correspondence. Um, so we at least have the content. Um, and some lovely little signatures of Tolkien. Anyway, the reason why I was freaking out a little bit earlier when we ran across uh, something about moonshine and um, homemade whiskey uh, being made in a still is because coming up next week on Archival Adventures, I'm sharing materials about uh, prohibition and temperance, <laughs> including materials about moonshine. Uh, so this week was all about letters. We will revisit some of these collections in the future so we can delve into them a little more deeply. I definitely want to get to the Buckminster Fuller one eventually. Um, and I think the, um, uh, what was it, Lucy Herndon Crockett papers, they seemed kind of interesting. Uh, so I'll probably do an entire stream on her. Um, but yeah, the plan for next week is material about prohibition and temperance. I have material from before prohibition went into effect and after it ended, as well as uh, the period of time when it was in effect, and so a variety of things, whether it be speeches that people made or um, somewhere there's supposed to be some ephemera uh, from uh, moonshiners, like ads from people 
who were making alcohol even during Prohibition. I don't know. I haven't seen them. I just found a thing that says we have them. So hopefully I will have that for next week. Anyway, um, I do want to say thank you all for joining me. I hope that I will see you again here next week um, for that exploration of those Prohibition materials. Let's see who we're going to pop things over to today. Because um, I have to tear all this down and head back down to my office before I go home. Um, yeah, I think today, let's see, we've got sea kelp from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Or I could throw it over to a wonderful, wonderful person that um, my viewers would probably enjoy hanging out with. And that is Stephen Joy's. Uh, who I have thrown streams over to multiple times in the past. He is a lovely streamer uh, based in Scotland. Um, just gonna set up those raids. Uh, and yeah, I will start that. And thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you once again, Eric, for bringing the whimsies over. Uh, even for the, the brief ending of stream here. Um, I very much appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope I see some of you again soon for another Archival Adventures. Um, as I said, next week is Prohibition and Temperance. And uh, we have fun exploring whatever we find in the archives. Um, until I do see you again, I hope that you enjoy exploring history. Bye.